Thank you all very much indeed for tuning in and uh, into this presentation. We're going to see how it works and how it runs. Um, I've got together a few slides and I moved things around a little bit. And I know the initial ask was talk about a bit, little bit about Slickcast. Uh, I'm kind of moving that towards the end because uh, I think it's more important to start about fly lines as a general. We just kind of get a little bit of feedback about fly lines uh, and then talk about that at the end, uh, the Slickcast. Okay, let's start off. So we're going to talk. We're going to dig into fly lines and talk a little bit about this thing called Slickcast, which is a new launch from Rio as of uh, of June, um, kind of at the end of it, as I alluded to. And uh, as Doug said at the beginning, I'm just going to pause every now and then and just open up to questions. If anyone's got questions, then uh, I think I'm just going to pass them on to me, and obviously we'll ask, answer those and um, just see how it goes. And really, if there's questions about fly lines or about Rio or about anything in the fly fishing world that is outside this presentation, at the end, there's a kind of more of a, a general question screen. So feel free at the end just to fire away questions that aren't relative to this presentation if I can help out. If I can't help out, I'll tell you I can't. <laughs> uh, so what are we going to talk about? We'll talk about string, a plastic covered string, core coatings, weights, tapers, stuff like that. And um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I did a presentation there to Jacaranda a couple of years ago when I was out there, a little fly line talk and a little fly line Olympics, which was awesome. Thoroughly enjoyed that evening and uh, wish I can come back and do that again, or hopefully I can come back and do it again in, in life rather than on this cyber video thing. Um, and so some of the slides, for those who were there, some of these slides you might recognize, you might have some of the answers I might be popping out there some of the questions, having run through this talk, uh, but there'll be some new information as well. So I'm not even gonna go into the bit design, right? Normally when I do this presentation, we talk a little bit about the core and the coating of a fly line and, and what the different cores are, what the different coatings are and how they make things happen in fly lines. And again, when we open up to questions, I'm very, very happy to answer questions on cores and coatings as we get into those uh, later on. But just kind of in light of the amount of time that we've got for this presentation, the amount of information I've kind of put together, I'm skipping out that, that chemistry side, the, the, the side that, you know, like the alchemist side of mixing stuff to create stuff. Uh, we're gonna talk about the important stuff, um, fly lines, how they differ. And really, a lot of these slides, if you're, a, if you're a proficient fly fisher and you've done a lot of fly fishing, some of these slides are obviously gonna be as clear as day to you. You're gonna know this stuff. Um, but I kind of like filling in gaps. You know, I, I like to kind of give some basic information about, about rods and lines. Um, and so if you know this, feel free to turn off by all means, or bear with me because there is a progression through, this, uh, through these slides. So fly lines, how do they differ? Well, the key things that really count to us as a fly fisherman is they're gonna differ in the, either in the weight of a fly line or the shape of a fly line. And the shape is some kind of called a taper, Sometimes it's called a profile, but kind of the shape of the line. Um, obviously, they differ in color and density and stuff like that. And we can touch on those as we go through this presentation. And towards the end, I'm going to touch on density lines. Um, but really, for the, for the essence of you as a fly fisher on getting the best performance out of a fly line, the crux of, of what I'm going to talk about is the weight of the line and the taper. And the weight of the fly line, well... <laughs> Again, this is a part that's really kind of the, the basics. Whenever you get a fly line, um, you'll see on the box, there's a little label on here and it's got lots of information on here. And this is the fly line code. And the fly line code has letters that mean something. And the letters, in the case of this example, WF5F tells you what shape it is, what weight it is, and what density it is. All right, the, the first letters, WF stands for weight forward, that's a shape, that's a profile, come back to that. The five, in this case, that's the line's weight. It relates to a scale, a standard, an industry standard, which I'll get this, the next section's about. And then the last thing, the last letter is F, which relates to its density. So in that example, we have an F of a floater. And in this example here, if you can kind of see it, there's an, it ends with an S, an S and a number. And the S means it sinks. So really that's what the code is. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about density later on. 
And the code, this part of the, co the conversation, this part of the talk is about the code of the line weight, the number five. And in theory, right, the five line should match your five rod, or a three line should match your three rod, or your nine weight line matches your nine weight rod. And really the idea behind the code is just a simplified system that if you're a novice fly fisher and you're just taking this up or you're just getting into it, it gives you a guideline, and it's no more than that, a guideline of selecting a line and a rod that match. And when you put a nine and a nine together or a five and a five together, you have a decent chance of this thing performing at its best. And that's the idea of the code. That's what the weight is. Now the weight, that's based on what is called the AFTMA standard. And the AFTMA standard, AFTMA stands for the Association of Fishing Tackle Manufacturers of America. And this thing was put together, I'm trying to remember when, gosh, it was certainly 70s-ish, something like that. I probably should do my homework to know when, irrelevant to this talk, but anyway, it's a standard. And basically the idea of a standard is that it says that if you are a line manufacturer, you take your first 30 feet of your fly line, whatever fly line it is, and you weigh it. And if you want to call that line a four weight, as in this example here, then that 30 feet should weigh 120 grains. If you want to call it a five weight, then that should be 140 grains, a six weight, that's 160 grains, right? That's, so that's what the standard is, is. The standard is a standard that line manufacturers make it. And therefore, as a rod manufacturer, they take a line and they put it on a rod, and if they want to make a rod that's called a four weight, they want that rod to feel really comfortable with about 120 grains. They want to call it a five weight, they want to make it comfortable with a weight of about 140 grains. So that's the, really the, the partnership between rod and line company that this industry standard brings. And that's about it. As a, as a novice and as a, as a beginning fly fisher, that's where you should like, draw a line and say, good, I've got it. Now, when you get beyond the novice fly fisher and you get into a bit more of an advanced fly fishing level or a bit more experience in your fly fishing world, then you start to look at things a little bit differently. And the first thing that we're going to look at is what is the difference between a five and a six? Right? So it, it, as it says on that chart there, the standard says the difference between a five and a six is 20 grains. And that's a fly line at 30 feet. So 20 grains in real life, 20 grains is this business card. Right? We've got my little business card. And if I put that on a grain scale and weigh it, that is what 20 grains is. So it's a tiny unit of weight. Um, and 20 grains, is, as I said, that's the difference in between a five weight and a six weight line. And I'm going to come back to this, why this is significant in a moment. If you took a nine foot 2x trout leader, just your regular trout leaders like this, and took this one's out of the packet, must have fished it on the weekend. Um, but if you took a nine foot 2x leader, that weighs 10 grains. So a leader on its own right is a half of a line size. That's quite an interesting little thing. And again, that's a little nugget I'd like you to hold on to for a second. Um, other nuggets uh, that I want you to hold on to, which are going to become relevant to this talk, um, is that every time you, if you've got a standard five weight line, it's just this perfect AFTM standard, and you've got exactly 30 feet, and you weigh that 30 feet, and it's 140 grains. Every time you lengthen it by five feet, so like what's that, 1.4, 1.7 meters or something like that, 1.8 meters, Every time you lengthen that line by just five feet, you increase the line size by one. So even with a regular five weight, if you have 30 feet and you're casting, that's a five weight. If you have 35 feet, then that's a six weight. If you have 40 feet, that's a seven weight. If you have 65 feet, and 65 feet is not a long cast, right, for, for a good caster. I don't mean shooting. Uh, what I mean is that you have 65 feet of line outside the tip of the rod. You have 65 feet of a five weight outside the rod, that's the same weight as 30 feet of a 12 weight. So when you change line lengths, you are changing line sizes. And, and when I say this, it's probably pretty obvious. I'm, I'm guessing some of you are nodding going, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. 
And equally, when you go the opposite direction, when you shorten your line, when you go less than 30 feet, you're putting less line weight on, so the line gets lighter, so you're putting effectively a different line size on. And again, a 15 feet of about a five weight line weighs about what a two weight is. So the point of this part of the conversation is really to get people comfortable with the idea that everybody fishes lines that are lighter and heavier than the standard, than the five weight on the five weight rod, because you're fishing different lengths, you're adding leaders, which is adding a half a line size, stuff like that. And I just want people to be comfortable with this knowledge that you don't have to have or worry about a fly line that says it is a line size heavy or it's two line size heavy. I mean, gosh, we make a line called the outbound short, we'll talk about it a little bit later, that's three line sizes heavy. So you know, when, when people read that and they don't have this, this background information, they go, oh, I just bought this five weight outbound short and I'm looking at the grains, it's the same with my A weight, I can't put that on my five weight rod. Well, yes, you can. I want you to be comfortable with that concept that you can absolutely put that on the rod and the reason there's so much weight in the line is it's designed to do something. And that part is what we'll talk about as we get through this presentation. So like I said, this is, this is really getting people comfortable with the idea that you can have different grains than exactly the line stand. So this is probably the good point to open up the thing to see. Does anyone have any questions about that at this second? Uh, Simon, no questions at the moment. <clears throat> Brilliant. Keep on it, right? You're at the other domain. All right, so moving on. Let's look at what I'm talking about. So we have two lines that we make in, at Rio. That one's called a light line, and one's called a technical trout. And those are built to the AEFTM standard. So what that means is, one second. Right, back is a beautiful thing about doing it here at home is that I've got everything, all my props around me. If I was over there without a prop, it would be a bit of a problem. So here's a line coil. And uh, there is on the front end, by tradition, the front end, a fly line has, I'm just pulling this thing out here so you can kind of see what I'm doing. Right, there's a front end, it's got a little welded loop on like that. And we make a little level section for the first six inches. And that's tradition, right? All line companies do that. And that stems from the old days, pre-loops, right? Right now, if you've got a loop on there, you can loop your leader on and go fishing. And that's how it works. In the old days, before lines had loops, every time you added a leader, you'd chop a piece of fly line off and you'd chop a bit of fly line off and you'd chop a piece off. And so they were built in these level tips to allow you to chop off bits of line without getting into the taper and chopping that off. Because once you start chopping the taper off, you're having a major effect on the line's performance. So when a line is built to the AFTM standard and weighed, it is removing the level tip. So if I chopped off the six inches here, and then I went back exactly 30 feet in the coil, and I weighed the light line and technical trout, and let's use the five weight as the example, and I weighed 30 feet of those minus that level tip, they will weigh 140 grains. So those two lines are built specifically to the stand. Our best-selling line around the world is the real gold and um, fairly closely followed by the real perception. Well, I wouldn't say close. Perception would probably be the second best, but the gold is our best-selling line. And both of those are half line size heavy. So if we have our 140 grain standard, these will be 150 grains, roughly. Right? A, bit, a line standard being 20 grains, so half of that being 10. What's that like? Hey, it's like taking my technical trout and putting a leader on. It's no more than that it is. Then we have the Rio Grande and the Big Nasty, right? Those are lines that are specifically designed to do something. And towards the end of this conversation, I'm actually going to talk about lines and, and the tapers and the design ideas behind the tapers. But these are a whole size up, so these are going to be 20 grains heavy. So we'll make a five-weight line, but we'll make it a six-weight. We'll make it 160 grains at 30 feet. And then we have the single handed spay line, one of the nicest casting all round lines we've made. Uh, and then the outbound short, which I alluded to earlier on. And those are two, so the single handed spay, and three line sizes heavy at 30 feet. So within this, the design of a line, when we sit down to make a line to do something, we'll think of what is it supposed to do and, and add weight 
or remove weight depending on that design. Now, again, we're going to come back to this weight thing for a second, but I just wanted to outline that not all lines are built the same. Not every five weight you buy is going to be a five weight. Some will be a six weight, some will be a seven, some will be an eight, some will be a five, and so on. And one of the casting games, uh, the Olympics we had, if you, for those of you who attended the, the club uh, event when I was down there and this little Olympic game we had, one of the funnest games um, that I've seen when we do these Olympics, it gets more feedback than pretty well anything else, is the flip-flop. And the flip-flop, for those who don't, uh, haven't attended the Olympics and had a go at this, the flip-flop is a casting game where we take a three-way glass fiber rod, just a real slow action, Reddington butter stick, and we take a 10 weight salt water powerful rod, like a predator, uh, you know, a pike rod, and we take a 10 weight line and put it on the three weight rod, and the three weight line, like a creek line, and put it on the 10 weight rod. And we flip these lines around, and then we lay these, line, these, these outfits down, and each person gets three casts to cast those two outfits as far as they can. That's what we call flip flop. So the point of that. It's first of all, yes, you can. I mean, everybody who had a go at this, even the rankest beginner, still managed to cast these completely imbalanced outfits. And what happens is, as you become more experienced at casting, you actually change your casting rhythm and your casting style, depending on what you feel. Right? When, you, when you have a flop, floppy, so that's a three-weight rod with a 10-weight line on, so the rod is heavily, massively overloaded, and the rod is flexing in the cork handle and right down here, then casters start to slow down their casting stroke and become a little bit more cautious and not so violent about it. And when you do the flip, when you have a stiff 10 weight rod with this three weight line on, there's no weight. And so casters can't feel anything and good casters start to speed up and accelerate and get harder and shorter, more positive stops. So as you develop a casting skill, your naturally changing your casting um, method to adapt for this. And more importantly than that, guess what? Your fly rod has a taper. So when you underload a rod, just the very tip of the rod flexes, and that's fine. And when you overload a rod, the rod flexes in the middle or it flexes in the butt section. The rod flexes in different sections, the more or less weight you put on it. So it's covered. And again, this is whole part of this conversation is to get comfortable with the idea that lines are heavy, but that works. Don't ever get put off by seeing a line that says it's three line sizes overweight and think it's not going to work. It's going to work really, really well. And as a matter of interest, just before I leave the flip-flop stage, is good casters, if you're a good caster, you'll cast the flip much further than you'll cast the flop. And if you're more of a novice caster where you, you don't really have the feel and the technique to change your casting timing, you'll cast the flop more than you outcast the flip. The flip, you won't even get it to work. It doesn't have any flex to it, so the line falls around your feet. But the flop, you'll get it out there. So generally speaking, what that means to say is that if you're a beginner caster or a novice or not a great caster, and you want some assistance in your casting, overload your rod slightly will help. All right, tapers. Roy, let's open up. Any questions on that so far? Okay, Simon, uh, the awesome questions. Just give me a chance to review. Ooh. The first question is from Tim. If the line is effectively three lines heavy, isn't it wrong to then label it as a five when it is really an eight? Isn't that against the standard? Oh, my gosh, that chestnut. Why do we start with that one? I don't know. <clears throat> oh, Tim. Um, so luckily for us... As line designers, the standard is a standard guideline, not a standard like, legal standard. So we don't have to follow it. So, and I say luckily because if you are fishing, let's, let's put it into a situation. So I, I'll use the outbound short as an example because that's the one that's the heaviest for us. And that's the one that's three sizes up. So the outbound short has a 30 foot long head. We're going to look at heads in a second when we look at this taper section. That's all it has. It has only 30 feet. The outbound short is designed to cast big flies a very, very long way. And as we'll see shortly in the taper section when we talk about big flies, a heavy line moves a big fly easier than a light line. And so in terms of 
choosing a correct line to cast a really large fly, let's say I want to go and fish something like one of these, and it's got you know, lots of mass to it, it's got dumbbell eyes on the front end, and there's a lot of weight to that. But I'm only fishing for, you know, 10, 12 inch, 14 inch trout. I don't want an eight weight rod for my fun of fishing those smaller fish. Right? I want my five weight rod or my three weight rod because the rod is more fun. It's a small creek, I don't need to cast far. So I'm choosing my three weight rod because of the species and the environment. But a regular three weight line wouldn't fish that. So over here, and it's certainly Northern Hemisphere, September, October time, right? I'm targeting brown trout. Brown trout are hitting big streamers. I want a small, uh, sorry, I want a line that's going to cast these big streamers. So yes, you could take an eight weight rod and put that eight weight line on it and cast the same big streamer, but that eight weight is completely overkill for the fish that I'm catching. And so that's why in our design parameters, we're designing the line to do the job it's supposed to do. There's no way any five weight we've got will cast a, a fly as far, a big fly as far and as easy as an outbound short. And that's if you take the five weight. Now you could have with this knowledge, of course you could go out and buy an eight weight line and put it on your five weight rod and have the same effect. But people are scared of that because they don't want to buy an eight weight line and put it on a five weight rod because you know, it doesn't occur to people that that can work. So everyone goes out and buys a five weight line and that's why we do it internally so the line's performance doesn't suffer. So hopefully that answers Tim's question. Okay, thank you, Simon, for that. Um, a continuation of that question, Tim asks, doesn't all of that render the AFDMA standard pointless? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> sort of. There's, there's, you know, in the industry, we've been, I say we, the industry, we've been hashing around for the last four or five years the concept and the idea of removing the AFNA standard totally because of this dichotomy. Nobody can come up with a solution that works because for that very simple fact that a, a, just a beginning angler, a fly fisher, does not comprehend that you can have multiple grain weights on a rod. If you labeled a rod, like a five weight rod, supposed to take 140 grains, so I could put 100 grains on that and cast it really easily. In fact, uh, I, I did it the other way last weekend. Um, and you can put 200 and 250 grains on that and cast it. So if you rod said 100 to 250 grains, what does somebody buy? Right? They, they, somebody can't go into a shop and, and pick a line for that rod because it says 100 to 250 grains. It doesn't help you at all if you're a novice. And so nobody's come up with a solution that's as clear as five and five and let the manufacturers within the design make the line do what it's supposed to as long as it says, for big flies, for presentation, for small creeks. Any others? Okay, thanks for that, um, Simon. The, another question is, you probably touch base with it, but Dirk asks, why go sizes up? Why go sizes up? Um, we, we will see that in a moment. Another question from Paul is, do you have a specific brand rod? and or series that you'd like to pair your lines to? You know, I like fast rods. Um, so to me, because a fast rod is something that uh, when I move, I move the line, right? Rather than a slow rod where I move, the rod starts to collapse. So I like a fast rod, except fishing really light leaders and tippets. So anything in the, in the speedy action out there that's comfortable to cast, right? There's a bunch of rods that are out there that are fast. Uh, and too fast, they have no soul, no sensitivity to them. They don't load at short range. Um, so I like, uh, you know, for big flies, I like the Predator series out of Reddington, that's a great one. Um, I like the X series from Sage, that's a really good series, uh, trout series. So th there's a bunch of them out there that are, I would class medium fast that are really good action for what I like. But again, I, I'll, I'll often go to a glass fiber rod. I fish the butter stick more than anything around with the local rivers here because the rivers are 15, 20 foot wide and the trout are eight to 10 inches long. So I love a little slow, soft action rod. So I go between the two, but for casting the faster action rods. Okay, Simon, I think we can continue. Thank you very much for answering those questions. All right, no worries. We'll open up later. Okay, so we got tapers and um, a whole pile of line tapers are a 
just shapes, right? As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, lines are shapes and shapes have weight, fatness, one side over the other side, like a front end or a back end. And before we actually look at that, let's just take a quick peek at some definitions. Um, and some definitions here, uh, this is a, what's called a weight forward. And a weight forward is a line that's got a front taper. I just want people to kind of have the names of it, the body section, and then the rear taper, right? And all three of those components, when you put them together is what's called the head, right? So we're gonna be talking about head length shortly, but that's what we're talking about head. It includes the front taper, the body, and then the rear taper. And then at the end of that, there's what's called the running line, and that's the thin skinny stuff behind. So to, that's what a weight forward is. We talked about that at the beginning of the conversation when I talked about the WF on the kind of uh, the abbreviations on the label here, the WF stands for weight forward. That's a line that kind of looks like this. And then the other abbreviation you'll get is DT, which is double taper. And double taper is basically abbreviated, as I said, to DT. And that's a line that doesn't have a long skinny running line. It has a front taper, it has a body, and it has a rear taper in its own right. And that's what a double taper is. So you'll either have WF at the beginning of your line name or you have DT at the beginning of the line on the, the code and that's what it relates to. Uh, what's important when you talk about this is what you look at is the, the length of these sections, right? So the front taper can be short, it can be long, it can be middle length, it can be gradual, it can be a bullet, it can be a, a, a compound taper. There's lots of the options and tapers that we can have as a line designer. Um, but generally speaking, when you look at a line and you design a line to do something, if it's got a short front taper, it goes from the fattest part of the line to the thinnest part of the line in three to four feet. So a meter say, that is considered a short front taper. Um, and what a short front taper does is it turns over, basically it makes your line turn over very rapidly. The line will kick, will turn over with lots of speed. It keeps the weight of the line at the front Right, so if you, if you are using a fly line to cast heavy stuff and you want a heavy fly to be cast, you want a fairly short front taper because the weight of the line is close to the weight of the fly and that moves it really easily. And what I used, I used this little analogy, um, and again, for those who've seen this presentation, apologies, because I'm going to see it again. Uh, I used this little analogy of you going to one of these carnivals, these fun fairs, and, and paying your quid to, to enter a game and you're being totally ripped off by the, um, the carny there. One of these games where it's impossible to win. And this game is that you've got a brick standing up and you're six feet away from this brick and this guy says to you, give me a quid and I'll give you three balls and you have to throw these balls at this brick and knock it over. And if you do, I'll give you 10 quid. And you go, oh, that's pretty easy, I can do that. Well, the first thing he does is he gives you a ping pong ball. And, uh, you know, you're a loser, immediately you've lost your quid. There's no way anyone can throw that ping pong ball with enough force to knock the brick over. If you were given a cricket ball, oh yeah, now that's a different situation. You gotta hit the brick, but the cricket ball will actually knock the brick over. And so what that brings up, and what I'll use this term fairly frequently, is the key physics, mass moves mass. That cricket ball will move the brick. So when you're casting flies, and I, I showed you this thing here, it's called an animal, um, but if you're casting flies that are big and heavy, or if you're putting a lot of split shot and weight on your fly line, swivels and things like that, or big indicators that have a lot of air resistance, you need mass, you need something to move that. And so a short front taper will help that because it keeps the front of the fly line weight close to that fly. On the other end of the scale, you can have a long front taper, and that could be five meters or eight meters. It can be up to 25, 30 feet long. I mean, you can get lines with really long, long tapers. And these slow down the presentation of the line. This gives you a much slower turnover of the line, lands gently. Um, so these are good for presentation and roll casting and spade casting, that kind of stuff. So when you, have a look, when you look at the shape of a line, when you go to a catalog or you go to a website, um, I'm just gonna grab a real catalog here and you kind of look at um, a trout line page, you'll see that lines have got shapes, right? They've got these profiles on them or they're on the back of the box. Right? The back of the box will have, have, the, have a profile and the shape. And kind of what you want to do is look at that and just look at the front taper to see is the taper long, is the taper short? 
because that will tell you a lot about what that line, line is designed to do. Short rear taper, well, that's a line designed for, for um, one-shot casts. Right? Very essential. If you were to design a line and flippantly, but kind of not flippantly, if you said, let me design a fly line to catch more fish, how would you do that? Well, one of the simplest things would be, imagine you're up on a lake or a dam and you throw your line out and you strip your fly back and you haven't caught something. Now you've got your throw line, your line back out again. A line with a short back taper means you get to that running line much faster than a line with a long back taper. So with a line with like a short back taper, you can get one cast, go back, bang, shoot, your line's out there. You only take two casts to get your line out back out in the middle of the lake again. So any line designed for quick distance is going to have a short rear taper. But any line that's going to be designed for mending or for stability when you're casting and can carry in lots of line in the air, that's going to have a long back taper. And the best example of a long back taper is a double taper. So if you took a double taper, for example, let's say you made a cast 70 feet long to a rising trout and your fly goes over the fish and it doesn't take it. One advantage with a long back taper or a long head, a double taper, is that you can pick up 70 feet and go straight back to that same spot. Right? With a short back taper and a short head length, you make a 70 foot cast, you've got to pull in, say, 40 feet of running line, then pick it up and then shoot it all the way back out there again. So you're wasting time and you're wasting the control. So the longer rear tapers, give you more versatility and control of your fly lines. And then most fly lines these days really are what's called a compound taper. This is a rear loaded compound taper where you have weight at the back. And this is a front loaded compound taper where you have weight at the front. The bottom one, this is your brick. This is the cricket ball knocking over the brick. This is mass moving mass. And the top one, that's the weight at the back. So that's more of a presentation. So anytime you want a line to land softly or you want a line to do that's great for roll casting or spay casting, with a one-handed rod, it's going to have weight at the back. And any time that you want to load quickly or cast heavy flies or turn over indicators or deal with a heavy wind, strong wind, that's going to have weight at the front. So as you'll see, all fly lines fall into that. There's very few fly lines in this category. Right at the very top of the screen, I have a green line that is a regular weight forward. There's no compound taper to it but pretty well every fly line these days is built with compound tapers either weight at the front as in this middle four section or weight at the back as in the bottom two there they'll fall into that so again look at the shape of the fly line and the shape of the fly line should tell you what the line's designed to do because we'll have weight at the front big flies wind easy casting on a lake right if you're on a lake the last thing you want to do is a weight at the back because again you're stripping the fly within 10 feet of you What's the point of having all the weight at the back of the line? You want the weight at the front to start the cast to make the casting quick and easy. That's why there's so many shapes of fly lines and tapers. So what I'm going to do now is just run through very quickly um, the line summary, the kind of the key Rio fly lines, the trout lines that we have that um, are different in shape. And with that knowledge, hopefully it'll make some kind of sense to you about why they're designed that. And then I'll open up to questions again. So the Rio Gold, that's our best-selling line and just just a general purpose line. Um, we have two lines we cast as general purpose, the real gold and the real perception. They're both a half a size up, if you recall from the earlier weight thing. The essential difference between the two is the gold has a long head, 47, 45 to 50 feet, depending on the size, the line size. Whereas the perception has a shorter head, sort of 33 to 37 feet in length depending on the line size. So they both will cast streamers and dry flies and nymphs. You know, if you just want a general purpose line, I would go with one of those two lines. The perception of the better line on smaller rivers and smaller lakes, where you want that ability to quickly get a couple of casts and shoot your line out, get onto the running line early, and you don't need a huge amount of distance. The goal is a better line on bigger rivers, better line if you're a good caster, better line if you're on big lakes where you want to carry 47, 50 feet of line before you shoot it, so you'll get more distance because you're already further out there before you shoot. The gold is a better line on big rivers where you have to make a cast and throw some men's in and, and control it because you've got much longer back taper. As you can see, there's 19 feet of back taper on the gold, 
and there's only six on that perception. So those are your two general purpose lines. And I would encourage anyone who wants a line that kind of just does a bit of everything and not a specialty line to go with one of those two. Then the lines get into specialty. The grand is the line I mentioned earlier on that is one size up and it is designed. That's the line I alluded to when I said, if you're a novice and you want that little bit of extra weight to make the rod flex a bit and feel more comfortable casting, the real grand's the line for you. It's, it's still got a relatively short head, 38 feet roughly. It's front loaded, so you don't need a lot of line out to make that rod load. And it's one size up. So again, you don't need to make a lot of distance casting, which as a novice caster, you're not going to be able to do and, and get some control. And that's what the Rio Grande is great. It's great for fast rods and it's great for people who are just getting into it. And then the technical trout, that's our fourth core fly line that's a just that's a that's a very interesting line it's got a long front taper 10 feet long that's considered long in fly lines so you'll get presentation but it's got weight pushed at the front because it's it was a line designed ostensibly and, and particularly for south africa sorry for new zealand um when you're fishing very very long leaders up in idaho and the henry's fork we have a technical spring creek there that you've got to fish 18 20 foot long leaders and you can't turn over a leader that length without having some mass at the front. And so it's got mass at the front, but it's always got a front taper that's long so it lands softly. So that's really a, a technical dry fly presentation style line. Single-handed spay, I mentioned that. That's a great line if you're rolling spay casting. Um, if you do a lot of that, then this is two sizes up. There's a lot of weight at the back. And I'm not gonna delve into that at this stage. If, unless somebody has a question, I'll happily delve into why weight at the back is a good roll casting and spay casting style of line. Um, but in the, in the interest of not prolonging this and boring everybody by too much information, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it if there's a question. The creek line is an interesting one. The creek line is a short head. So the creek line is loaded at 18 feet. So what that means is that the AFTM standard is at 18 feet, not at 30 feet. So if it's a two weight, it's what the two weight should weigh we're basically half of a rod size, a line size out. Because if you're fishing a creek, you're not going to be fishing 30 feet of line. It makes no sense to have a line, if you're fishing 10, 15 feet in small streams, standard, because you'll never get to the weight to make that rod feel comfortable. So with a creek line, we load it up at 18 feet. It's, to be honest, it's a shitty line to cast at 40 feet or 50 feet. It's not designed for that. You can look at, the, look at where the weight is. If you get to 40 or 50 feet, you're on running line out there. It's a terrible line casting that, but it's not designed for that. If you're hitting a lot of small rivers and you're fishing in that 10, 12 to 20, 25 feet range. So you've got to convert that to meters like four meters to seven, eight meters long. That is what the creek line is designed. It's just where the weight is and how much it is. Oh, and that was the tapers. Um, Question, any questions on that? I've obviously missed stuff out. I skipped I a couple think, of things there. Just think, what, what have we got, Roy? I think, I think, uh, Simon, let me just check with you. Tim asks, Fost, isn't a Fost weight, uh, uh, sorry, isn't a Fost five weight a slow eight weight then? <laughs> well, yes. If you talk to a line company, you, you know, we, we delve in fly lines and yes, I mean, a fast, wow. That's a good one I could get started on. <laughs> very simply, yes, you can get a real fast five weight and a, and a slow eight weight, and they'll take a similar grain weight. Uh, a fast five weight, if you overload it with three line sizes, to an eight weight will flex deeper, and you'll get a first fairly similar flex pattern to an eight weight that's correctly loaded. Um, you just got to ask rod companies why some rods are so, so fast that they are effectively a seven weight or an eight weight when they call them a five weight. I don't know why that is. And it makes it hard in line back to the AFT and things as a, as a line designer, because if you put a regular five weight on a really fast five weight rod, most people are not going to feel it work. And what's an interesting savior, if you like, in, in terms of this uh, is, the, is the, you are limited in the line design by the head length. And what I mean by that, go back in your mind a number of slides where I said that with a standard five weight, every time you extend by five feet, you go up a size. 
Okay, so what that means is if we have a line like the outbound short, and I think it was Tim who asked this question, well, why, is it, why do you label it an eight weight? Um, the outbound short, the head length is 30 feet, right? So you cannot go beyond 30 feet because you have very, very thin running line. You can't cast a thin running line. So every time we create a line that is heavier and heavier in the industry standard, we shorten and contract the head length so you can't overload it. So if you took the outbound short, three line sizes up, that had a 60 foot head on it, you know, people would absolutely crush a rod because not only is the line heavy, but it's very, very long and heavy and the potential of letting more weight out is there. So there is always a safety factor in the line designs that we observe and in the single handed spade, as you can see here on the screen right now, it's 34 feet. That's the line that's two sizes up. So the maximum you can have out in terms of weight is three sizes up, right? Imagine the 30 feet is two sizes up plus your five feet extra one size. So that's no, no different than you taking a regular technical trout line at 30 feet and having 45 feet of it out there, right? It's no different from that in terms of weight. So lines are limited when we do upline them by their head length. So that's the kind of like the safety net. So you don't ever have to worry about completely overloading it. But to the question about rods, yes, I, I, I'm not sure about that. We have to design lines like the Rio Grande for fast action rods because rods do get faster and they don't load with a regular fiber. We have to do that in the line design and then call a line for fast action rods to help that situation out. So if somebody doesn't blame the line, say this line is sure it doesn't load with a rod because the rod's too stiff. Okay, th thanks. What else? Thanks, Simon. No worries. There's another one from Alfie. He says, relating fly line front taper to leader length. If the fishing mm. conditions require a very long tapered leader, say 15 to 20 feet, what is the considerations regarding front taper length and weight distribution? Yes, that's an excellent question. And that was one of the things we had tried to address. And I think we did address because it is my favorite all round trout line with the technical trout. In the early days, if you know Rio lines, before we had the technical trout, we had a line called the Trout LT. Uh, LT was long taper or light touch, depending on what you wanted to call it. But it was a dry fly presentation line, had a very long front taper of about 18 to 20 feet long. Um, was great with a nine foot trout line, a, a nine foot leader and, and, and a couple of size, you know, size 18 Adams. But it failed miserably with 16, 18 and 20 foot leaders. When we went up to Henry's Fork and fished the the real technical fishery up there that you need an 18 or 20 foot leader with all the weight at the back, kind of like the, the uh, single handed spay you're looking at here on the screen, there wasn't enough mass at the front to turn over these long leaders. And so you constantly get your leader collapsing. So when we sat down to readjust this and create a line designed to turn over these long technical leaders, that's what the technical trout is. It's got a long front taper, 10 feet, which is, uh, long and you compare it to any other trout line we've got it's the longest front taper of a trout line we've got but we then pushed weight to the front right behind that taper so there's mass pushing through the taper to turn over those long leaders and that's what you have to do if you want a long leader is you've got to have mass at the front you still want to taper because you don't want there's a there's a, a technical thing when you when you're really analyze casting if a fly line has no taper uh, sorry, no leader or no taper, and you cast, what will happen is as the line unrolls, it will turn over so fast, it won't land straight, it will kick down and the tip of the line will kick onto the water. So if you had weight at the front of the line and a short front taper, and then put a long delicate leader, there is no transition there that will absorb that energy kick and your line will kick. And so, you'll just get bad presentation. So you have to combine that long front taper with weight at the front. Hopefully that answered it. Thanks, Simon. Next question from Kyle. How do the Versi leaders affect the line weights or castability of the lines they are on? Oh, yeah. Huh. Very interesting question. <laughs> and I was about to answer it and say, well, why didn't you watch the video? And that's because we haven't released it yet. <laughs> um, I was just editing it yesterday, which is why it's fresh in my head. So we've just literally filmed 
uh, a, a video, one of our how-to series. Is if you watch those, it'll be upcoming in a couple of months. It's called How to Fish Sinking Leaders, and it talks about sinking leaders and matching them to rods and to lines. Um, but a versa leader, for those who don't know, it's a sinking leader. Basically, it's a leader. It's coated in the compound that make it sink or float. It sinks at different rate. Um, and they replace your leader. The important thing to understand is it replaces your tapered leader. It doesn't replace your line tip, right? There's a, there's a confusion in, in versus sinking leaders and sinking tips. A sinking tip is uh, designed, I'll get one here, to replace, uh, let's see, where's my versa leader? So these are sinking tips, right? You can get tips that are 10, 15 foot long, and these replace the taper of your fly line. So any of these lines you see on the screen, if you chopped it back 10 or 15 feet, you would loop this on, and this is a replacement to make that line a sink tip. Some people don't want that. They don't want to chop their fly line, can't understand why. I would buy another one, it wasn't. Um, but if you don't want to do that, then you put on a sinking leader, and a sinking leader is a few grains heavier than a leader, uh, like 40 grains as opposed to the 10 grains, so it's a few grains heavier than a leader. Um, but it doesn't replace the taper, it replaces your tapered leader. So generally what you do is you put this onto your fly line and on the front end of your versa sinking leader, you just add on three or four foot of tippet. You don't add on another leader, you just add on a tippet. So generally speaking, the faster the sinking leader is, the more weight the front end of that fly line will have to have. Right, that... Um, the Rio Grande, the Rio Gold, the Rio Perception, lines like that will handle sinking leaders very well. Even the technical trout will now with that weight at the front. Whereas a line like single-handed spay here, where there's so much weight at the back, looking at the shape, you'd say, oh, that can't handle a sinking leader. But don't forget, this is two sizes up. So it has the mass to do so. So generally speaking, to answer the question, every line we design, we try and make sure that it will fish a sinking leader on the front end. Four to six weight, right? The one and two weights, they don't have enough mass to cast them. But generally speaking, four to six weights, you could add a sinking leader to pretty well any of these lines and, and turn it into a sinking tip if you wanted to. It does add grain weight, so that's the only thing you've got to expect. If this is 30 grains or 40 grains, remember 40 grains is two line sizes. So take that into your account if you are worried about overloading the rod. You shouldn't be. Hopefully, this, at this stage in the conversation, everybody is going, yeah, I don't need to worry too much about having to match my grain weight line to my grain weight rod. Thanks, Simon. I think the last question for the section is, are line coatings susceptible to degradation when exposed to sunscreens? Oh, yes, they are, actually. That's an excellent question. We should give that guy a hat. If I have a hat, I'll give it to him. <laughs> um, I like giving hats for good questions. So yes, uh, right. So there's a um, uh, there's an ingredient in fly lines. Most fly lines these days are made out of PVC. There's um, Portland, Rio, Scientific Anglers, Orvis, Wolf, um, Teeny, brands like that, Hardy. All those lines are made out of PVC fly lines. And the reason is PVC is a compound. We missed this part out because I chose to. Uh, that is very easy to control tapers. And PVC is attacked by things like mis mosquito repellent, sunscreen, uh, UV, things like that. And so uh, we build in uh, compounds that fight that, right? But still, you don't want to have sunscreen and mosquito repellent and things like that on your fly line because that will attack what's called the phthalate. The phthalate is a is a plasticizer that keeps your line supple. Uh, and if your line dries out, then when it flexes, it cracks. So you'll speed that process up if you have sunscreen and put it onto your fly line accidentally or mosquito repellent, stuff like that will attack it. So just pay a little bit of caution on that. Make sure you don't, uh, make sure you have fairly clean hands when you're handling your fly line if you've got sunscreen on. Thanks, Simon. Um, no more questions for this section. So you can proceed, please. Okay, onwards. So we're going to talk about Connect Core Plus. Um, and I know this conversation was about slick cast. Uh, you know, the initial idea was to talk about slick cast. I'm coming to that because I want to talk about the two technologies that we've just introduced. 
This is the part that will be new information for those who attended my presentation before. Um, Connect Core Plus, right, when you have a fly line, it's got a core in the middle and cores and fly lines have stretch. Now we've had for a long time an in-touch series of fly lines. Uh, I know we've, they're fairly popular in South Africa there, the Connect Core and the in-touch series of fly lines. This is an advancement on the Connect Core. It's 30% less stretch than your standard core, so it's a low stretch. Um, it's a bit more stretch than Connect Core, and we've gone to that because we're finding that a lot of lines with Connect Core, when you stretch them, you can't really pull any memory out because there's not a lot of stretch on there. So there's a little bit more stretch on them than Connect Core, so you can pull the memory out. There's a little bit more shock absorption. Some people are concerned about the very low stretch snapping off on light tippets. Um, but the biggest factor is the core is a completely new material, uh, and it gives a very, very incredibly smooth long-lasting coating to the uh, bond to the coating. So what Connect Core Plus is basically is our next generation of Connect Core. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because um, we have this new series of lines, which will come out, which we're gonna talk about in a second, uh, called the Elite and the Elite. What makes the fly lines the Elite is the fact they have this Connect Core. So what I'm gonna show you now is I'm gonna put a little video, it's like hopefully it works, and. Roy, please tell me if this thing slows down and buffers and stops. At Rio, we're often asked what makes a great fly line. And while there are a number of answers depending on the application, the core material is by far the most important. The core provides the strength of the fly line as well as determining how stiff or coily the line will be. For example, if a line is built on a weak core like this one, it'll break easily. If it's built on a stiff core like this, it ends up wiry with a lot of memory. And if it's built on a stretchy core like this one, the line will actually give when it's placed under tension and stretch a lot while you're fishing. Clearly, making the best fly line in the world starts with finding the right core material. As Chris said, developing the right fly line starts with the right core. And here at Rio, we test an awful lot of different core materials to find the right one for each fly line, species, and destination. Even after we develop a groundbreaking core material, we don't stop developing and testing new materials for better options. Take low stretch lines for example. We started with the idea to make a minimal stretch fly line so you could improve your casting and fishing performance and we came up with Connect Core. After years of developing and testing new materials, we found a way to improve upon that performance. Our new core material offers increased smoothness of the coating as well as overall better fishing performance. We call this next generation core Connect Core Plus, and it offers anglers all the benefits of a low stretch core, enhanced sensitivity, faster hook sets, and less wasted energy with a significantly longer lifetime. Our improved core gives just enough to allow for easy hand stretching to remove any coils that may develop. That allows for a straighter line connection to your fly, giving you a more direct connection to the fish and your drift, resulting in easier casting and more fish. We have spent countless hours on the water testing and developing our improved Connect Core, and it is without a doubt the best core material that we have ever produced for cool and temperate fishing conditions. Look out for it in our Elite series of fly lines at your local Rio dealer or online. Um, so what the Elite series is, is the Elite series is a new series of fly lines uh, that have Connect Core Plus. They have this slick cast, which we're talking about in a moment. Um, they have the max float tip, which is a high floating tip. As you can see in the diagram below, they've all got this triple color scheme, which we call Surefire. And really the idea of the Surefire, not a lot of people quite understand that, is that if you look at that image at the bottom of the screen, the front color is about the minimum we feel that you need out for a rod to load. So if you're fishing that bottom line there, which is a Rio Gold, and you've got some green and you're casting a little bit longer, when you get a little bit of yellow outside uh, your hand and up the rod, now you're gonna find that rod loads up better. And then the gray, that's the running line section. You don't want any gray outside the rod because that means the running line is the really thin part and the thin part's trying to move the thick part and the thin fails. So really, all Surefire is, is kind of a visual cue about what, is, what part of the fly line loads you up. So everything in the elite family you're going to have that. Um, everything in the Elite family is going to be pr is printed, has the identification marks on them so you can read a little printer. You don't need a sticky label now stuck on your reel. Um, they're all printed on the fly line three feet from the front. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is because I've mentioned the, the, the our core four 
trout lines, Rio Gold, Rio Grande, the Rio Perception, and the technical trout. So all of these lines, if you've known these lines in the past, these now are available in this elite series. This has replaced the in-touch, so there's no in-touch golds, grands, perceptions, and technical trouts anymore because we've got this new Connect Core Plus in there, plus the slick cast. Um, and when I talk about slick cast, I'll come back to that one for a second. But just to give you a rough idea, if you're looking, hey, there's two real golds out there. One's an elite, one's your regular premier. Then you've got the Connect Core Plus, and you've got the Surefire as the main differences between them. And then slick cast. Slick cast is the thing which probably is our, certainly from the Rio lab, is probably our most incredible development that we've, we've come across in, in terms of everything that our R&D team have come up with. It's a, it's a formulation and a process and a chemistry that creates a coating that we call it slick cast because it's very, very slick. Um, simply, well, it's not simply, let's just, uh, let's just have a look at some of the numbers. Um, so slick cast is very durable, right? There's a, when a fly line flexes, we talked about it kind of with the, with the sunscreen and the mosquito repellent, right? The fly line flexes and, and dries out and cracks. So one of the things the slick cast is, is, is the material is far, far, far tougher than, um, than the regular PVC materials. And you'll see some numbers in a second that will kind of show you. Slickness, uh, I, I had teed up a video, which obviously I'm not gonna play now because of course you can't hear it, but I had teed a video that would show you these lab tests going. And basically, what I'd like you to imagine is, let me find something round. Basically, there's a wheel like this, right? And then there's a fly line hanging down the wheel here, off this, this chrome wheel. And there's a, a, a machine that's pulling it this way. And a tie, tied to the bottom of this, this fly line is a weight that's precise, 50 grains. And the machine pulls it. And if it takes, let's just keep it numbers really simple. If it takes 51 grains of force to move 50 grains, there's a grain of friction. Right, this is simplifying it, but it gives you an idea. If it takes 55 grains of force to pull it, there's five grains of friction, right? So everything else is the same. It just measures how much friction, how much drag there is of a line going over this chrome wheel. And so when we test slit cast, um, we found that the slit cast is beyond slick. If, you, if anyone's fished a slit cast there, then you can certainly add your comments to this later on when we open it up. If you haven't yet, the, without any marketing nonsense, I absolutely, you will make one cast and go, I have never felt anything quite so slick as that in the fly line. Because there isn't. I mean, this, all these other bar charts we have here are all competitor lines. The bronze color one you see is max cast. That's our regular coating that was on our in-touch lines and our regular um, lines. And, and slick cast is so much less friction and drag than that that it's incredible to cast it. You will cast it and go, like everybody else who's cast it, the feedback is amazing on that. So anyway, slick cast is just a very, very slick coating. It's still a PVC base, but there's a chemistry change we had in there. There's a bond change to the core. We found a different way to bond the core to the coating that gives it this long lifespan. But in terms of slickness, it is the slickest thing of every fly line out there. Some people don't want slickness, right? If you don't want slickness in the fly line, then you probably want to go to your regular fly lines. If you want really slick fly lines that shoot well, that disperse the water, that make you be able to mend well, then something with slick cast is probably up your alley. And then as a little comparison, um, and again, the video would show you this. Uh, and if you're interested, I can play the video and just not hear it and you can see it. Doug, you can let me know when we start if you want to do that. There's two things to think about a fly line in terms of how long does a fly line last. Fly line lasts, um, abrasion is where chunks will come off your fly line, right? Bits of coating come off. Uh, you rub a fly line over a tree branch, over the, stand on it on the bottom of a, a boat, stand on it on some gravel, right? You're, 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 the action is pushing coating off the fly line. So that is what's called abrasion as a, as a code. 
And to a braid a fly line, and again, as I said, you can watch the video by all means, it'll be two minutes without sound, but you'll see it. We take a rod and we saw a fly line back and forth over this static rod. And we're trying to wear off the coating by doing this. Um, there's a machine that does it, there's a weight that keeps attention, and we're basically sawing a fly line and we're trying to see if we can rub off the coating. And when we compare the abrasion, that's called an abrasion test, when we compare an abrasion of a, of a slick cast line over all our competitors or our max cast, again, the bronze colors are max cast, you can see that there's an incredible, some far, far tougher coating than anything that we've ever come across, anything we've ever tested from our competitors, anything we've ever been able to build. So that's abrasion. And then the other one you'll see often referenced is what's called cracking. And that's just the nature of a fly line flexing and getting cracks right through where it flexes. Um, and that, again, we have a test for that, which again, you can see if you want to, no sound in the video or not. And a fly line, what we found out with our test on this one is this line with slick cast is, and again, you can look at the charts here, 40,000 cycles before we develop any, it seems to develop any sign of cracking compared to 30,000 from some of our competitors, 30,000 on our in-touch lines, 25, 15,000 on other competitors. So of all the stuff we've tested, it is the slickest, toughest fly line coating we've come across. Now I'm sure th this will get better in the future, but right now there is nothing slicker than that. And that is what we make slick cast. <laughs> There's a fish. <laughs> All right. All right. Sweet. In the Rio R&D department, we're always striving for the next iteration that's going to make our fly lines perform even better, both for our own fishing and also for anglers worldwide. One thing we felt was vitally important was to increase the life expectancy of a fly line. We also wanted to make the slickest fly line on the market so you can very easily shoot line and feed lines into drifts. Slickcast is the slickest coating we've tested to date in our lab. So how do we know it's the slickest? Let's go to the lab to find out. To test the fly line slickness, we weave a sample of the line through a series of chrome bars. One end is attached to a weight and we pull on the other end to start the line moving and maintain its motion. We measure the forces required throughout the test. The higher the forces required to move the line, the worse it will perform on the water. Here you can see a competitor's line being pulled through our test setup and the resistance is being recorded on the graph in real time. Now a slick cast line is being pulled through the same test setup. We repeat this test multiple times to ensure accurate, repeatable results. And on average, 49% less force is required to move our slick cast line. We have yet to test a slicker fly line sample. To determine a fly line's resistance to cracking, we've developed a proprietary test that replicates the stress that a fly line feels when it's being cast. The test is run until cracks are observed in the fly line, and then the number of cycles that it takes for those cracks to develop is recorded in our testing database. Here we have two samples that have been run to the same number of cycles. On this sample here, we can clearly see the cracks that have started to develop. However, on this sample, there's not a crack to be seen. This yellow sample with no cracks is built using our slick cast coating. To test the toughness of a coating, We've developed another proprietary test that replicates the abrasion that a fly line goes through while being fished. The test is run until small bits of coating start to come off, which is the first sign of abrasion. Here we have samples from two different fly lines that have been run to exactly the same number of cycles. On these two samples, we can clearly see small bits of coating coming off of the fly line, the first sign of abrasion. However, on these two samples, we see no bits of coating, showing that there's a much tougher line. Those two lines were made with our slick cast coating, which, in our lab test, lasts nearly 90,000 cycles longer than our closest competitor. Slick cast represents a radical improvement in fly line technology that allows me to make the smoothest drifts and the longest casts I've ever made. More importantly for me, I know slick cast coating will last for many, many trips to come.
Um, so what we've got here is really just, this is the new Premier series of lines, right? We've always had the in-touch gold and we've always had the Premier gold. Both of those have been replaced, the in-touch gold, as I mentioned, by the Elite series with the Connect Core Plus. And then the regular gold has been replaced by the slick cast. It's still a Premier series. It's still in a, um, a green looking box that has the um, uh, Premier on it. Let's see if I can grab one of those boxes, but I can. Uh, that it signifies it doesn't have the Connect Core Plus. So really the only difference for those out there who are looking at these two and saying, oh, there's two real gold or two real perceptions and I'm not sure which one I want to get. The Elite series has the Connect Core Plus, the low stretch and the three color Surefire. The Premier series doesn't have, the, has a regular stretchy core and it only has the two color front end, right? So some people, they don't really worry about the three colors. It's not a feature you're interested in. It's, um, if you don't particularly want the low stretch, then I would go with the Premier Series, right? There's definitely a price difference. I don't know what, the, what it is in South Africa, what the retail is in Rand in South Africa, but John can perhaps mention at the end of the conversation what it is. Um, but there's a price difference between the two, and the difference you're paying for is either the three colors or this low stretch core, right? Both of these lines now will have the slick cast, and really that's what this is about. That's the thing I think I'm most excited about, or we're most excited about Rio, is the slick coat coating that uh, slick cast gives it in life, like the longevity. So that's the Premier Series, and again, as I mentioned earlier, slick cast has gone into this low stretch Connect Core uh, Elite Series. So anything with this new packaging, Gold Grand Perception Technical Trout, our four core trout lines, you can get them in either the Elite or the new Premier Series. So, any questions before we look at lake lines? I think, Simon, allow me to, to post some questions to you. We're, we're wrapping up here. I know what time you've got. It comes, so. comes from Tim. Uh, does the slick cast make a noticeable difference to pick up off the water? Yes and no. So, we still, all those lines still have our max cast technology, and max cast is a hydrophobic coating, so repels water. So, um, when a line is picked up off water, if, if the line's chemistry is pushing water away, it comes out very much cleaner and with a lot less water attached to it, so you don't get as much spray coming off the water. Um, so slick cast doesn't, in its own nature, make them come off the water any better. Max cast does, but max cast is in both of those lines anyway. So if you went to a line like our mainstream series or our average series that doesn't have max cast, or even our regular in-touch lines, like any some of the lines we haven't gone yet to slick cast, they will, if they've got max cast, they will come out cleaner and quieter and easier out of the water. Next question is, <clears throat> do you need specific line cleaning or dressing materials like line speed for slick cast? No, you don't need sp special ones. It is worth cleaning your fly line. Um, you know, it does, exp it does it prolong the shelf life of a fly line. Mm. The, the things to avoid, Avoid is probably the wrong word. Things to be cautious of, right? There's some line cleaners, and I don't know if these are available in South Africa, but to, for example, there's one that Umqua put out called Glide. Glide's a great line cleaner. It makes the line real slick. But Glide is a, is a waxed base cleaner. And fly line has pores. So the moment you apply a wax coating to it, you seal the pores. And the pores, we just, we, the, the, the slate cast chemistry has slick cast right through the depth of the coating. So the pores is de are designed in your fly line so the slick stuff comes out. So if you apply a line cleaner that's a wax base, you will seal up the pores. You lose the natural slickening agents coming through. But you know, the wax is a fairly slick thing. So as long as you keep applying it and polishing it and buffing it, you'll get the, the slickness performance. But that's a caution is don't just apply something like that and seal the core pores up and expect the line to to start to, to maintain its slickness because it won't. And then the other thing to be careful of, a lot of people use Armor Oil over here in America, again, as a, as a line cleaner. It's a, it's a plastic dashboard cleaner for cars. Armor Oil itself as a, as a chemistry is, is fine, but most people use it through an aerosol, you know, like a spray can. And there's a propellant built into the spray can that when you push the button down, pushes out the chemistry of Armor Oil. The propellant is a violent attack, or attacker of phthalates. That will dry your fly line out quicker, almost than any chemistry. 
So if you're doing using stuff like Armor All, don't ever use the spray version, right? Or any line cleaner that's a spray. Don't use any aerosols around fly lines because those the propellants are vicious attackers. Um, so you don't need a particular one. Just use some caution on there. There's a bunch of them out there. You know, of course, we make one at Rio, which is our Agent X line dressing. SA make their own version. They will all work. Armor All will work if it's not a spray one. Um, so, but you will get a, a, a longer lifespan by doing that. Um, and and what, one note is the pores can fill with dirt, right? When you're fishing in a lake and you're stripping the line in and laying it on the ground, can fill with dirt. And so one of the, the steps you want to do to keep your fly line's slickness and lifespan is get the dirt out of the pores, right? If there's a lump of dirt in a pore, it can agitate and start the line to crack. So getting the dirt out of the pores of your fly line is pretty important. And you can do that real easy at the end of the day, just with a soft cloth and a bit of warm water and like a very mild hand soap, right? Not a dish soap. And just wipe the line down just to get the dust off there and out of the pores. You can do it like that. So that's an essential part to prolong the life of your fly line. It's not really cleaning, more maintenance. Thanks, Simon. Another one, the last one for the section. Will all the different Rio lines be available with slip cast in the future? Yes. I knew that question would come up because it came up every time I've mentioned I've done this one. Yes, we have a plan to phase that in. Um, we don't have a timeline on it. And I, right now, I don't know what is going to be next on there. You know, our, our cycles are traditionally, uh, we got messed up this year with COVID. The COVID thing pushed this, this cycle back to June and we were supposed to be releasing it at the beginning of the year. Um, and whole pile of things came in and you know, we're supposed to bring it out April in our trout season. Oh, we couldn't because COVID, COVID shut down our factory, couldn't make any fly lines. So everything's delayed, but generally speaking, our cycles are usually August um, and, and the new year. So sometime in the new year, we'll probably have some, you know, some more lines with, with slick cast in there. I don't know what yet, we're still working out on the plan, but eventually everything in our premium series and everything in our touch series will move to either slick cast on its own or slick cast with our connect core the elite series i don't know when but it's, it's looking at the long-term plan it's a three-year plan it's a long process to change over everything thanks simon for for answering those questions uh, please proceed hey no worries so this last few slides this is just something um john suggested putting together because of the dams the fishing in the dams and the uh, and, and the lakes, uh, and we're just going to talk, talk a little bit about the sinking lines at lakes because this is a new series we came out with last year, which still hasn't really made got the, made the rounds um, and got popular. But it, so I just wanted to run through, um, having fished Sturkeys anyway a few times myself, I, I know that there's some pretty damn good lake fishing out there. Uh, I just want to run through a few of the lake lake sinking lines. Right, there's always a floating line. No point in touching on floating lines um, at this stage. So we got a numerous types of lines of sink. The midge tip is a very, very good little sinking line. It's got a three foot, one meter long intermediate section. Um, and this chart, can you see it clearly, Roy? I'll, I'll let you ask answer that one. Can you see clearly the, the, the words? The writing on the charts? Yes, we can. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, it's fine. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. If it was small, then I wouldn't talk about talk in more detail. But anyway, there's a whole series of sinking lines, right? And they all sink at different rates. And in, in the world of fly lines, fly lines are measured in IPS, inches per second. So one IPS will sink one inch every second. Seven IPS sinks seven inches every second. So that's the sink rate. Um, that's what, it, what, what, what is quoted when it quotes uh, IPS. So there's a bunch of sinking lines. Right, we have a hover sinking line, we have a midge tip, we have a camolux and aqualux, and they all sink at different rates. And really understanding this chart is pretty valuable for anybody who goes lake fishing because you, you know that you want to fish a bay that's 10 feet deep and you want to be on the bottom. And you want, to want, you want a, a sinking line that's going to get down to 10 feet. If you have a line that sinks one inch a second, it's going to take a very long time to get that line down 10 feet. So understanding the sink rate is pretty important. And this chart really just goes through the sink rate of all the lines we have at Rio. Uh, and and the, the main sinking lines we call our fathoms. Fathom three, it's called fathom three because it sinks at three inches a second. Fathom five, 
five inches a second, six, and so on. So the fathom of six is a good one because it's, uh, it's easy to compute, six inches a second, so it sinks one foot every two seconds. So if you have a 10 foot hole, right, you let it sink 20 seconds and the line will be down 10 feet. That's how you kind of utilize the sink rate. And the fathom is just a series of sinking lines we have at Rio um, that, oh, where is it now? I've skipped it out. Hang on, we'll come back to fathom. There it is. It's just a series of sinking lines we have at Rio that um, are color coded, right? The running lines are different colors because one of the commonest mistakes if you've got four reels with four different sinking lines on is they're all the same colors. You can't identify them too easily. So the fathom lines have got a different color running line. And even though they're blue and maroon and, and green, they still have the same sink rate as the body. If you do a lot of lake fishing, you'll know what a hang marker is. A hang marker is a little one inch section we put 20 feet from the front end that basically tells you when to stop stripping and when to fish the hang. If you fish the hang, that will make sense to you. If you don't fish the hang, that will make no sense at all. But what it is, it's a very good mark of when you stop stripping and start to lift off the cast. So you don't strip the whole head, the sinking line in, and then the lead is in your rod, and it makes it hard to cast. So the hang marker is just a visual cue of when to stop retrie retrieving. And we print on the hang marker what the line size is and what the line sink rate. So that's your identification. So that's your regular fathom. And then the fathom clean sweep, well, that's a, that's a series of lines which have an intermediate front end, have a fast sinking bottom end, have a slow sinking back end. And they're called sweep because they're supposed to, there's, what, there's a style of sinking line. If you fish a lot of dams and lakes, you'll, you'll probably be aware of it, but there's a style of sinking line called a sweep line, which is what this is. And the idea about sweep lines is when you really have no idea where the fish are and you want to find the fish, the sweep line, because of the intermediate tip, the fast sinking section sinks very, very rapidly down and the tip's up here. So as you strip, your fly goes down, round at the deep section and then comes back up. So you cover a vast section of, of depth of water with sweep lines. Whereas when you look at a uh, regular sinking line, you can see that they sink, that they're density compensated, so the tip sinks the same speed as the front end, so they sink down here. You'll get the quick sink down there, but it stays at that one depth. You don't have that range of depth. So if you're ever prospecting with sinking lines in lakes, then the sweep series is probably your better sinking pipe to get rather than a, a fathom, regular fathom, which is a regular sinking line. And as you can see here, there's, there's two styles. They are a sink four body, four inches a second with sink two running line. Very complicated if you're new to this game. I'm, I'm sorry if you are, because it's a lot of numbers and complications. And a sink six body, really fast sinking with a sink two back end and a, an intermediate front end. And those ones, they have a hang marker on, but the printing is on the front. As you can see on that little inset image, it's printed on the very front loop so you can look at it um, and determine what it is. So the, those are the sweep lines we've got. If you're a lake fisherman, they're definitely worth having one in your, uh, in, your, in your bag for when you just don't know where the fish are and you want to cover the depths. And that's how it fishes. And then um, I'll talk about the fly line selector app. So on the Rio website, we have a, an app, which if you just listen to this and you're completely lost, then you can go to this little line selector app and you can say, I want to fish a sinking line with a big fly and in a river. And it, steers you to the right fly line. It's, it's, a, it's a database that we've formulated all the paths and you can just pick the right line that way without having listened to this entire presentation. <laughs> so it's on the Rio website. You can download it too and get it on your phone if you want, but it's on the Rio website. And that, in a nutshell, is about all I have to say, which is a huge amount. I do apologize. It's gone on a, quite a bit longer than um, I anticipated, but let me open it up back to you guys and, and see if there's any questions. I know I missed one uh, from Tim. Don't, don't you make two different gold lines? We do. Um, before slick cast, there was the premier gold, which was just the ordinary one. And then the in touch gold, which had the low stretch core. We still have those two, but they now are the elite one with the, the new low stretch core, the connect core plus, and the new premier one with slick cast. 
So we still have two, just one is the, the low stretch core and one the regular stretch core. Okay. Another one. With the sweep lines, how do you know at which depth you found the fish? <laughs> yeah. The tricky uh, you always, <laughs> yeah, You always count the depth, right? When you're, when you're fishing any sinking line, let's say you've got the sink six one because that's our easy math one. Um, and you throw it out there and it sinks at six inches a second. Let's say you wait 10 seconds before you start any stripping. Right, you know that the sink six would have got down about five feet, and if you get a grab there, you know you that you should keep fishing around that ten seconds. And if you don't get anything, the next cast you let sink twelve seconds, so you're at six feet. And the next cast, you know, you, you you just you count how many seconds you let your line sink before you start stripping, and that gives you, as long as you don't vary your retrieve. Right, there's variables everywhere. This is no more than guidelines. But if you let it sink six seconds and you strip it like this. And then next one, you let it sink six seconds and you strip it like this, you're going to have a completely different depth. So the general concepts of lake fishing is you count the depth of sinking lines and you fish a few casts at a certain depth. And then, yeah, you, know, you look at the conditions and you go, God, it's bright sun, it's beating down, the fish aren't rising, they're probably deep, so let me go a bit deeper. Or it's clouded over, there's a few fish starting to rise, so let me come up in depth. But generally, you follow a, a process. And, and the important thing is you count how many seconds you let them sink and you, you try and, once you start hitting fish, you try and stay at that depth. Because it's a pretty good guideline at what temperature, whether thermocline or whether the Daphne is in the water column or what depth the fish are feeding. Thank you very much, Simon, John, Gigan, Stuart. Thank you very much. Be safe out there. Eh? Thanks, everyone. Great, right. great. Thank you. you Thanks, Simon. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Yeah.